Hello, hello everybody. What's going on? What's happening? This your girl Tiffany coming through right here, live in the fact. So today I'm going to be dealing with the topic. Well, dealing with two topics, actually. Uh, once again, Ramadan Mubarak to all you beautiful people out there that celebrate Ramadan. And for those of you that get that got vaccinated, I hope everybody's being safe. I hope everybody's okay. I hope you guys enjoying your Ramadan for those of you that are still fasting. Also, like I said, um, I want to deal with these two topics about two individuals, uh, both who were a Sudanese background, and they both were Muslim. Um, they were very prominent, much prominent within the Pan-African and also in the African-American community. And the people that I want to talk about is Duse Muhammad Ali and also Sati Majid. All right. So first I'm going to talk about Duse Muhammad Ali. So I have some interesting sources. Uh, I try to find as much information as I possibly could about Duse Muhammad, but we're going to go ahead and go to everybody's favorite website, Wikipedia. All right. We're going to start that off first, the go-to website. So as you can see, this is a picture of Duse Muhammad Ali. Now, what's significant about Duse Muhammad Ali is because his close tie with Marcus Garvey. At once upon a time, he was a mentor to Marcus Garvey. Marcus Garvey learned a lot under him. Okay. He really helped Marcus Garvey a lot. You know what I'm saying? With his organization, which is the UNIA stand for uh, the United Negro Improvement Association or excuse me, Universal Negro Improvement Association. So he has helped out a lot with Garvey. He has really got Garvey and everything. And he also started his own newspaper company, which was called the uh, African and or Oriental Times, the African and Oriental Times. So go, for those of you that don't know what Oriental means, Oriental is those of Asian background, you know, the Asian area, this region. Yeah. So that's what Oriental is. Um, and then he had started a newspaper or whatnot. So we're going to go into that. But let's check out his biography. That's him. That's his picture. Now let's see what uh, Wiki One is talking about here. Then I'm going to other sources. So do say Muhammad Ali was born on November the 21st of 1866, and he died June the 25th of 1945. Now he went by the name Bay Effendi. Bay Effendi. All right. So as you guys know, he was Muslim. Um, and I believe he was also a Moor, if I'm not mistaken. Or I I mean not a Moor, but uh, a Sufi. I could be wrong, but I know he was Muslim of a Muslim background. Uh, anyways, uh, he was born as a Sudanese Egyptian actor, okay, and he was a, a political activist who became known for his African nationalism. He was also a playwright, historian, journalist, editor, and publisher. In 1912, he founded the African Times and Orient Review, later revived as the African and Orient Review, which published in total through 1920. He lived and mostly and worked mostly in England with time in the United States and Nigeria. In the latter location, he founded the Comments Press, LTD, and the Comment Newspaper in Lagos. So it says he was born in Alexandria, Egypt. All right. His father was Abdul Salim Ali, an officer in the Egyptian army. His mother was Sudanese, and he received his early training in Egypt, but at the age of nine or ten, his father arranged for him to go to England to be educated. His father died in 1882 while serving at the Battle of Tel el Kambir in Egypt. After that, the younger Ali, then 16, was forced to return to Egypt after settling affairs with his father's estate. Ali returned to England as the War of Canterbury. Canterbury. He pursued his studies at King's College, London. Ali had originally intended to study as a doctor and had started on relating studies before his father's death. Afterward, he wanted to write and act on completing his studies at the University of London. 
All right, so this goes out to his acting career um, and as a playwright. All right, so he was in the company of Herbert Beer, Beerbaum Tree and, and Lily Lantry's production of Antony and Cleopatra at the Royal Princess Theater in London. And as an actor, Ali toured the British Isles. He produced Othello and the Merchant of Venice at Hull, Yorkshire in 1902, playing the parts of Othello and the Prince of Morocco. He earned praises from the British press. And so he wrote several plays producing the Jews' Revenge in 1903 at the Royal Surrey Theatre in London, a Cleopatra Night in 1907 at Dundee, and the Lily of Bermuda in 1909, a musical comedy at the Theatre Royal Manchester. The productions were praised by the British and American press. His production and performances in A Daughter of Judah in 1906, which he produced in the Glasgow Empire Theater received particularly good reviews. So he was a he was a good actor and a good writer. Anyways, it says he toured to the United States where he produced several plays and won recognition as an actor. All right, and in London he found the Hall Shakespeare Society of which Sir Henry Ivory was the first president, representing his political interests and considerable British interests in the Orient. He founded the Anglo Ottoman Society in London. Its members included Lords Newton, Lam Lamerton, uh, was it Shroud or Stroughton and Marbray. In 1915, Ali founded and was secretary of the Indian Muslim Soldiers, Widows, and Orphans War Fund. Among its patrons were Casulo, the Dutris of Marlboro, the Right Honor D. Lloyd George, Sir Edward Gray, Lord and Lady uh, Lamerton, and Lord and Lady Newton, the Marquis and Marsh was it Marcian Marcianis of Crew, Mrs. H. H. As Asquith, Sir Austin, and almost the members of the British cabinet. All right. So you can see he have done uh his philanthropy work already, where he um helped founded the Indian Muslim soldiers. So you know, for people who were widows and children who was orphans of parents that was involved in um, the war in India. He helped found an organization for them to make sure they was catered to and they had something, you know, some resources available, whatnot. Um, and by him being a lecturer and journalist, let's look at this. So after the first Universal Racist Congress, held at the University of London in 1911, Ali, with the help of John Eldry Jones, a journalist from Sierra Leone, in 1912, founded the African Times and Orient Review in London. Financial assistance in launching the paper was given by some West Africans who were temporary in London, including J.E. Casely Hayford, a journalist and activist, Francis T. Dove, and C.W. Beck, Betts from Sierra Leone founded as a British colony, and Dr. Anguntola Sapara from Lagos, Nigeria. The journal advocated pan African nationalism. It became a forum for African and other intellectuals and activists from around the world. It attracted numerous contributors, including George Bernard Shaw, H.G. Wells, Annie Bazan. Sir Harry H. Johnson, Henry Francis Dowling, and Williams, William H. Ferris. All right. So right here, it goes on to say the young Marcus Garvey then studied in London from Jamaica, frequently visited Ali's Fleet Street office and was mentioned by was mentored by him. The journal covered issues in the United States, the Caribbean, West Africa, South Africa, and Egypt. Garvey briefly worked for Ali and contributed an article to the journal's 
October 1913 issue. All right. So let me go ahead and pull up the article real fast that goes into further detail about Marcus Garvey and Duse Muhammad. Okay, so hopefully you guys can see that screen. So right here, I'm on the article called everydaymuslim.org, which is a good website. Um, goes into not just only the Islamic history, but also dealing with the African-American who were in Islam practicing and whatnot. So right here, it says where I got it highlighted. One of the most prominent figures future intellectual contributing to the African Times and Orient Review was the Black activist and Pan-African Africanist leader and public figure Marcus Garvey. As a student in London in the early 1910s, Garvey met Ali and wrote for the African Times and Orient Review. Professor Khalid Mahmoud of Aband University, who wrote the introduction to in the land of the Pharaoh's second edition suggests that Ali's knowledge of African history, ge uh, geography were profoundly influences on Garvey as were, was perhaps Duse's heritage as a Muslim. Mahmoud suggested that the Garvey motto, one God, one aim, one destiny may have resulted from the influence on Garvey of Ali's Muslim heritage. To be sure, some people, including the English Arabians, Wilford Blunt questioned Ali's Egyptian Muslim heritage, arguing that he knew little, if any, Arabic and was unable to recite the Shahada. However, the fact that Ali consistently identified as both Egyptian and Muslim throughout his life and was accepted as such by members of the Egyptian community in London and by other Muslims suggests that Blunt's assessment of Ali's Muslim identity was not shared by all. All right. And so, as you can see, it goes on down talking about more about his uh, newspaper. So, right here, it says the African Time and Orient Review was significant, not just for its family co contributors, but, but for its international focus. The review sought to re represent the views of the colored man, whether African or Oriental, from the Pillars of Hercules to the Golden Horn, from the Gang of Ghanaians to the Euphrates, from the Nile to the Potomac, and from the Mississippi to the Amazon, east, west, north, or south, wherever the Oriental or African may found a congregated habitation, from this shall our information spring. The circulation seemed to have been genuinely worldwide. Professor Lynn Innes of the University of Kent notes that among the places which had agents for the African time and Orient review were West Africa, South Africa, New York, Louisville, Memphis, Los Angeles, with the West Indies, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Cairo, Tokyo, uh, Calcutta, Lahore, Kolua, Lampore, and Colombo. And the Reportage was simply similarly broad. For example, the first edition featured a report on Lake Mohawk Conference of Friends of the Indian and other depend, dependent peoples, an article on the protests against government distilleries for Sion, and a report on the treatment of skeet laborers or shake laborers by the Canadian government. The broad international focus of the African Times and Orient view is characteristic of Ali's consistent advocacy for unity between colonized people irrespective of nationality or origin, unlike many other writers and thinkers of the time. All, Ali always supported a broad resistance to racism formed by people of all faiths, ethnicity, and origins in addressing readers of the black race, the brown race, and the yellow race. In the review, Ali can be seen as an early proponent for solidarity between what would today be termed people of color. The international and interreligious focus of the journal meant that readers across the world could take in part in discussion and debates 
through the paper and could learn about international anti-racist struggles. All right. So just to stop right there. Now, his newspaper did not last very long because, of course, due to financial struggles. But just to give a general idea and consensus of what do say Muhammad Ali did as far as his work and his contribution with not just only uh, his philanthropy work, but also with Garvey as well. You know, like I say, he has mentored Garvey throughout his years, you know, his younger years when he was in London before he even started the Pan-African movement, uh, the UNIA. So he has had put a lot of great influence on Garvey. All right, now I'm gonna go back to his biography. All right, so right here, Going back to his biography, it says in 1921, following the demise of the African Orient Review, Ali traveled to the United States, never returned to Britain. In the U.S., he briefly worked with Garvey's Universal Negro Improvement Association movement. He also contributed articles on African issues to the UNIA's The Negro World. He taught in a Department of African Affairs. Now, he also traveled and settled in Nigeria. So Ali first traveled to Nigeria in July of 1921. The Lagos community welcomed him at the Shita Mosque. He returned to Lagos in 19. 31, primarily to watch over his interest in the cocoa business. In the cocoa business, he settled in Lagos, where he was appointed editor of the Nigerian Daily Times. And it says on October the 3rd, 1932, Ali produced the play A Daughter of Pharaoh in the Glover Memorial Hall, Lagos, according to the Nigerian Daily Times. It set a new standard in Lagos entertainment, introducing real stagecraft. Now, check this out. Before long, Ali became editor of the Daily Telegraph, having as his immediate assistant, Ayo. La Jadou is what, right, yeah. So, subsequently, editor of the Nigerian Daily Times, spending his publishing interest on July 27, 1933. Ali began, Ali began publication of the comment, a weekly newspaper. He took great interest in the educational and general war, welfare of the Muslim community in Lagos. Now, following a protracted illness. Muhammad Ali died at the age of 78 in African Hospital, Lagos, on June 25th, 1945. His funeral took place on June 27, 1945. Attendees numbered well over 5,000, including political, social, and religious leaders. A short kutbah in English was delivered by L.B. Augusto, president of the Islamic Society of Nigeria. A short oration in Arabic was also delivered by Decori, a friend. A large funeral procession went through the streets to Akinsuna Muslim Cemetery where Ali was buried. So he stayed his final years in Nigeria and he has contributed a lot to the Nigerian community or to the Lagos community. Uh, especially in the Islamic community, um, he has done the newspaper, the daily newspaper, and he has put his primary focus in what was going on with the Muslims in the community. So throughout his life, Duse Muhammad Ali was very more focused on the activism and the relation with the Africans and the Asian community like particularly the Middle East, Asian, the South Asian, whatever. So that's what he was primarily focusing on, right? But his, especially with the Africans and with the Muslims, because by him being a Muslim, his whole thing was, all right, let's bring 
the blacks, the yellow people, and the brown people all together in one room and operate under one umbrella as a collective, especially as Muslim. So to combat the concept of racism. And there was another man who was on that similar path as do say Muhammad Ali. But before I go there, right, about his biography, I want to show you a, a, a book that was well, actually a couple of books that do say Muhammad Ali wrote. He wrote his autobiography, which um, I was not able to find, but he also wrote a book called In the Land of the Pharaohs. So let me show you guys this book real quick. All right, you guys can see that, cool. So let's go to the front cover. All right, the front cover of this book called In the Land of the Pharaohs, all right? And he wrote this book in 1911. So let's go to chapter one, the introductory, In the Land of the Pharaohs. So he writes, in attempting to write a history, I am quite aware of the difficulties which present my path and as much as there are so many histories of Egypt many of these histories are wise and not a few otherwise but each and every one for the most part is prejudicial to home rule in Egypt and is wanting in that chief historical element impartiality for upwards of a quarter of a century, I have noted the continual growth of misrepresentation in the English press touching Egyptian affairs and the Roosevelt Guildhall uh, per, 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 peroration that, I mean, yeah, peroration has proved the last straw of a most weighty bundle. That I am qualified to deal adequately with the period under consideration, their need be little doubt in the first place. I am a native Egyptian with a full knowledge of the aims of my fellow countrymen and consequently in sympathy with their suffering socially and politically. In the second place, not only was I in the city of Alexandria during its bombard bombardment, but the fact that my father was an officer in the Egyptian army and an ardent supporter of Ahmed Arabi laying down his life gladly for the cause of Egyptian independence in the trenches of Tel El, El Kabir give, gave me ample opportunities not only of coming into contact with many of the leaders of the Egyptian reform, but of obtaining a firsthand knowledge of their views, a knowledge not imparted to any European then residing in Egypt, excepting of course Mr. Wilfred Blunt and Sir William Gregory, and I believe Dr. John Nennett. So the reason for him writing this book is to combat against the misinformation about the Egyptian government in that time period. All right. So he said, you know what? I can tell the better story and a better history about Egypt than these European because I was born there. I was born in Alexandria. My father was in the military. All right. He was in the Egyptian military. That was his attitude. He said, I could tell a better story because what they're telling to the world is not enough information or they are underrepresented uh, Egypt or they're not telling the whole entire thing. So let me write this book and let me tell it from what I know and from what I dealt with. That was his attitude. So he wanted to clear up the misconception. And of course, we all know how the Europeans get down. We ain't gonna say all of them, but a good amount of them are very biased and they try to uh, operate from their mindset from their point of view, instead of really dealing with history for what it is, even, you know, when we go back and study about genetics and, um, yeah, about, you know, scientific information regarding to, you know, the people, the native people in certain areas of Africa at the time period before all this advanced technology came about, many of them were biased, okay? 
they operate from a biased point of view because they try to use that superiority concept to dictate and to give a narrative about history. So, so do say Muhammad said, you know what, I'm going to clear this up as much as I can. And I'm going to tell it from what I know and from what I experience and what it's really like as a native. Because he was a native of Egypt. Okay. He was born in Egypt. Now let's go ahead. Let's look at the story. So I'm only going to read chapter one. And I probably won't read all of it because I, I got to get to the next source. But anyways. He said, since 1884, I have practically resided in England where my education began in 1876. Now withstanding this fact i have kept in touch with the intellectual and political advancement of egypt and i therefore feel that in delivering this message i do so in some measure as one having authority i have no acts to grind nor am i identified with any political party the reader may therefore count upon an honest and impartial statement of facts i might say in this connection that of late years orientals when conversing with Europeans, and especially in this, in in this the case with regard to Egypt, have been rather recent, reticent regarding their political views, and this because Europeans have used information imparted by the natives for native destruction. Hence, the complexity of Egyptian opinion, which is so very rarely what it seems that no true estimate of it can be formed from superficial observation. Uh, Kendor was a characteristic of the old Arab until the coming of the Frank, among whom Kendor was honored more in the breach than in the observing. If therefore the European finds the modern Egyptian difficult to understand, that difficulty has been produced by the Europeans themselves. Mm. Woo. He was going in. Egyptian faith in European was very great, especially did this apply to the English prior to the events of 1882. Since that day, Egyptians have become sadder and wiser men, and this quickened process of intellectual enlightenment has effectu effectually closed their lips. Let me hasten to add that we are not unmindful or no, nor ungrateful for the benefits which have been conferred by England, we also admit that Ishmael's legacy of debt and political chaos required exceptional administrative capacity to extricate the country from its impending ruin. All right. All right, so let me... Let me go ahead and, um, okay, let me finish this part. But it must not be forgotten that Arabi Pasha and his co-reformers co were men of unquestionable ability, notwithstanding all that has been written to the contrary, and that these men, although recklessly accused of the usual oriental incapacity, had outlined many of the reforms and improvements which were introduced by Lord Cromer with such conspicuous success. Herbert Paul says, bigotry dies hard and slowly, but it dies. Color prejudice, on the other hand, is not infrequently shifted from one ship to, I mean, one ship of state to another, but never by any chance it casts overboard. Color prejudice is at the root of most of the oriental incapacity, which bulks so largely in English literature. I have patiently awaited the death of color prejudice for many years, and I have a rather large spade in readiness where with the expedite, or expedite is interment, but I greatly fear its tale of years is likely to wrest the laurels from the hoary brow of Methuselah Salih. 
establish, establishing for itself a long distance record which no human agency will ever take away. Anglo-Saxon educational achievement is accounted uh, eru erudition, er, was it erudition? Yeah, erudition. While Oriental educational attainments are indiscriminately labeled educational veneer or a veneer of Western culture. And this applies not only to Oriental, but to all the color races of the world. Thus, a university degree is either a valuable asset in the march of social or and political process, or it is not. If it is valuable only to the Anglo-Saxon, the European would be well advised to close his educational portals immediately and forthwith throw overboard the nauseating can't about fitting the Oriental for self-government, giving the native a share in the government when he is qualified, and the remainder of the sentimental nonsense complacently digest by the superficial British reader. Nonsense helps to slob the official conscience of a re reactionary British bureaucracy, but does not hoodwink the Oriental of and even average in intelligence. I have yet to learn that an English university degree may be obtained by an Oriental without mental effort, the veneer of European culture notwithstanding. A British soldier in India fresh from the east end of London will apply the apoporous uh, epithet nigger, oh, with equal impartiality to a Maharaj or a Hindu priest, and the gentlemanly, gentlemanly snob from the London suburbs would not be outdone by the by the soldier in his expressed contempt for the native. Fortunately, British policy is not shaped with, I mean, shaped in white chapter, nor it is usual to select statements in tooting. In like manner, an Oriental bazaar, a bazaar may be a place for the interchange of views, but it is hardly the abiding habitation of Oriental thought. All right, so as you can see, he was combating against racism and he was not having it. So there's a picture of the Muslims in Egypt praying, and it's saying God is present to Mohammedans in a sense in which. I mean, okay, God is present to present to Mohammedans in a sense in which he is rarely present to us amidst the hurry and confusion of the West. Dean Stanley. All right, so as you can see, he was giving his rebuttal and he's saying enough is enough. Enough of, enough of the foolishness and how the European try to make themselves be more intellectual and putting themselves on the pedestal and how they try to rewrite history. He said, enough of that. You're not going to do that with me, especially to my people in Egypt. I'm not going for it because I come from that land. You're not going to play with me. So that's basically the attitude that do say Muhammad Ali say, you're not going to play with me. I'm going to cut this bullshit out right now. That's how he felt. And anyways, going down, he said, those who have visited Spain gazing admirably on the Alhambra and other remnants of Moorish architecture walked by the forebearers of that very Arab stock who at present inhabit the Delta must perforce admit it that these edifices, uh, edifices were the results of Oriental intellect uh, aided by the veneer of European culture or Western civilization, the mirth not infrequently provoked in the breast of the Anglo-Saxon tourists by reason of the visible signs of Mohammedan worship in which are daily observed in the streets of Cairo. It's another of the many evidence of insular prejudice and limiting understanding. It must not be forgotten that in Egypt, religion enters largely into the social fabric, whereas in Europe, religion take a secondary place in practice, if not in theory. Islam is positive. Christianity, especially um, 
Protestantism is negative. There can be little doubt that irreligion among the Mohammedans and even the Coptic Christians of Egypt has been the result of French and British occupation and the attendant evils of the contemplation. All these matters shall be dealt with in their proper place. I would add that it is because I believe the people of Great Britain to be not only a freedom loving race, but possess of a genuine desire to see other nations as free as themselves that I am emboldened to pen these pages. All right. So just to leave that off, if you guys want to look more into this book, in the land of the pharaohs you can check it out okay so you can uh go and find it on the pdf and i'm quite sure you can find it on amazon if it's not out of print um or you can probably find it on scrib so scrib is another app where you can find books and uh, documents and articles on the apps you know, but you have to pay like nine dollars and ninety nine cents a month. But anyways, as we can see, uh, Duce Ali was going in, and he was pretty much fed up with the European narrative, like many of us, how the European like to twist and turn information and try to configure something to make it sound more fitting to them and he said nah we ain't gonna do that no we're not gonna do that you see you're not gonna play with my intelligence you're not gonna play with my people and you're not gonna play with my history so do say wasn't going for it he was not going for it all right so also i want to show you guys a book called the old islam in detroit all right Let's check out this book real fast. Oh, Islam in Detroit. You guys can see that, see my screen. Now, this book was written by Sally Howell. Oh, Islam in Detroit, rediscovering the Muslim American past. So let's go to chapter one. Let's look at the introduction real quick, the first paragraph. Right here, where I got it highlighted. Let me go ahead and zoom that up. It says, Detroit, Michigan has been home to sizable Muslim communities for over 100 years. Today, there are at least 70 mosques, I mean, mosques in the city and its suburbs, including several of the nation's largest, oldest, and most influential congregation. Effort to build a city first mosque began before World War One and subsequent campaigns to control reform and sometimes replace these institutions have played a central role in shaping muslim american identity the ability of muslims to embrace american models of citizenship and the willingness of non-muslims to incorporate islam in the american mainstream are plainly visible in this history and i mean as are dramatic shifts positives and negative in the status of the cities muslim population there have been over the last century many variants of islam in detroit tracing the development interaction alteration coexisting and disappearance of these tradition reveals important trends in the muslim american past and it suggests new possibility both political and religious for the future of islam in north america all right so again these are the table of content And let me talk real fast. So the Islamic community is very um, prominent up in the northern area, in the Midwest, especially places like Chicago, New York, Detroit, uh, Cleveland. It's very prominent because that's where you're going to end uh, Philadelphia as well and New Jersey. You're going to find a lot of the Islamic community you know, it, they have a very strong population in those areas, in those regions. All right. So when you had immigrants coming over there, coming into these places, not just Arabs, but also African descended people, such as the brother who I'm going to be speaking about um, 
Sati Majid, who happened to be one of them. Sati Majid was one of them who was able to go into African American areas and uh, start building his own um, organization, which was based off the Sunni Islamic culture and building the mosque and whatnot. And what a lot of people don't know that the Nation of Islam originally started in Detroit in the 30s before they moved to Chicago. That was the home of the Nation of Islam, Detroit, Michigan. Yep. So when Elijah Muhammad was under fire Muhammad, he opened up his temple right there. They was called uh, the Lost Fruit of Islam at the time, I believe. That's what they were called, the Lost Fruit of Islam, before they would change their name to Nation of Islam. They were founded right there in Detroit. So Detroit has been a, a center for the Islamic community. You know, and the Islamic community is very big up there. So, yep. And I have relatives that's from Detroit. My mother, who is an ancestor, she was from Detroit. And her whole side of the family, of course, my sister as well. So, yeah, the Islamic community is pretty big and very popular. But it's been a long time. But also, they deal with a lot of opioid crisis up there, too, in, in the area called Dearborn, Michigan, which is like the suburb of Detroit. They deal with a lot of opioid crisis in the Arab community as well. So, yeah. But let me go ahead and get to this book. Um, so... Here it is, chapter three. They are Orientals and love the East. All right. Now, I'm going to skip down to where it goes into the story about um, Duse Ali more in detail. But right here, let's see. Let's look at this first paragraph right here. It says the Muslim American identity that began to take part. Uh, take shape in Detroit in the 1920s did so under condition in which Islam had assumed heightened political and cultural significance. The city's second mosque, the Universal Islamic Society, was established in 1925 in a direct response to the geopolitical upheavals of the period. Unlike the Muslim mosque of Highland Park, the UIS was not the brainchild of a wealthy, would be patron it was the product of a multi-racial alliance of pan-african and pan-muslim activists who sought for a brief time to pursue their political and religious agendas together these agendas reflected a growing sub alternate consciousness among detroit muslims that was fed by new u.s immigration and naturalization laws um, polemical media representation of Islam and anti-black racism and mounting resistance to European colonial policies in Asia, the Middle East, and Africa. Now, let's skip down to All right, so right here, where it says the Universal Islamic Society Exploring Pan-Islamic in Detroit. On April 25th, 1926, a photograph appeared in the Detroit news under the headline, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar means God is the greatest. It's chanted in Detroit when cities Muslim gathered for service. Two men shown embracing each other in the picture are Duse Muhammad Ali on left and Khalil Bazi. The accompanying story is grandiose in language. It was for the first time in history of the faith that the throne of Allah was besheathed by communal prayer from Detroit. Here in black and white was evidence that Detroit Muslims had moved on after their disappointment in Highland Park. Organized now as the UIS, Greater Detroit's Second Mosque was not one man's dream, but a collective endure, 
and Dover are undertaken by a committee of founders who share political as well as religious ambition. As the name Universal Islamic Society indicates that, I mean, indicate this was explicitly pan-Muslim project. All right, so that's a picture of Duse Ali, Duse Muhammad Ali and Khalil Blasi embracing each other. Okay. Again, so Duse Muhammad was about the unification. He was he was not only into pan Africanism, but he was also a pan Islamist as well. So of course, it goes on to state that uh, the USI incorporated with the state of Michigan on October the 12th of 1925 in order to provide religious and benevolent services. Right, and then it's a picture of the Holy Prayer at the New Oriental Hall led by Sheikh Khalil Brazi. And then go down to here. It says, like Dr. Saeed Hussan, Duse Muhammad Ali, president of the UIS, had come to Detroit at the specific request of the society whose members were familiar with his career as a pan-Africanist organizer in London and in, in New York. Although a practicing Muslim, Ali's public speaking and political activism emphasized secular rather than explicitly religious topic. In this sense, his public persona different differed from those of Mutifi Sadiq and Sati Majid, who described themselves first and foremost as Muslim missionaries. What were UIS leaders thinking when they invited political activists like Ali to Detroit? They were not expected to lead congregational prayers. Were they summoned to the city simply to de deliver public lectures and write Editorials and local newspaper. What large, what larger agenda did the UIS hope to pursue? So right here, where it says, "Do say Muhammad Ali race man in Detroit." All right, right here it says, "Do say Muhammad was one such." race man, a pan-Africanist and pan-Muslim leader who came to Detroit in 1926 after having mentored and collaborated with Marcus Garvey in London and New York. Before considering his role in the UIS, it is worth exploring briefly his profile as a pan-Africanist in the early 20th century. This profile explained why he was invited to Detroit and what he hoped to accomplish there. Do say Ali's acolyte Marcus Garvey was also a significant figure to those in movements like the Moorish Science Temple and in the Nation of Islam, the latter of which was launched in Detroit in the period immediately after Ali left the city. Okay, so of course, it goes into his life. It says, in his free time, he frequent, he frequent the work, Woking Mosque and Ahmadiyya run mission that was a center of Muslim anti-colonial activism in Europe. It was here that Ali first encountered pan-Islamism and saw how his this political project could intersect with a parallel pan-Africanism. After dropping out of medical school, Ali worked as both an actor and political activist. Okay. So right here, he wrote, Ali's mission statement for the journal reads as follows. The recent Universal Racist Congress co convenient in the metropolis of the Anglo-Saxon would clearly demonstrate that here was an ample need for an oriental pan-African journal at the seat of the British Empire, which would lay the aims, desire, and ambition of the black, brown, and yellow races within and without the empire at the throne of Caesar. For whereas there is extensive Anglo-Saxon press devoted to the interests of the Anglo-Saxon, it is obvious 
that this vehicle of thought and information may only be used in a limited and restricted sense in its communication of African and Oriental, Oriental aims. Hence, the truth about African and Oriental condition is really stated with precision and accuracy in the columns of European press. The voices of millions of Britons and lighting dark, dark, darkened races are never heard. Their capacity underrated. This content is fermented by reasons of systematic injustice and misrepresentation. All right. So... So go further down. It says, while in Detroit, Ali pursued these goals within and beyond the UIS, he became involved with a second organization as well, the America Asia Society. This group sought to bring about more amicable, amicable relations and a better understanding between America and the Orient in general than had previously been obtained. According to their incorporation papers, this group was led by Mrs. Consello Holmes, President Shair Mohammed Karashi, Vice President and Treasurer, and Dusay Mohammed Ali, Founder and Secretary. Ali acted as the group in Prosero directing and performing in two short costume dramas, lecturing and running a speaker series as well. The group was successful enough to attract the patronage of the Persian charge the Aferes, the Egyptian minister in Washington and his wife, and the mayor of Detroit and his wife. With, but within a year of its founding, the group succumbed to infighting among different Asian groups and disbanding. All right, and it says, in keeping with his more public role of race man, Ali also started an Oriental Theater Company in Detroit, which performed several of his original works. There were performing a Daughter of Judah at Orchestra Hall in late October 1926, when Harry Houdini died of a rapture appendix at the Garrick Theater nearby. Ali's troupe quickly moved to the Garrick to fill in for Houdini Council shows where they received positive press for works oriental in substance, a star, Dusay Ali, who was a large factor in the success of the plays. All right. And so it says... It goes on to say, Dusay Ali who performed the role of Oriental African on stage and wore a face when he appeared in public undoubtedly contributed to the embrace of Oriental sartorial display among black political and religious movement of period. In his memoir, Ali stated explicitly that he wore fez, a hat then popular among urban men in the former Ottoman Empire because it helped him accentuate his identity as an exotic outsider, thus protecting himself from the insult and injury of American anti-Black racism. Sylvester Johnson has suggested that these motifs and symbols were attractive to Blacks in the 1920s who were eager to overturn the racial category of Negro by asserting that this identity was misleading, misnomer because it denied their rightful claim to a rich legacy of pre-American origins and ancestry. At least race politics were consistent with this desire to construct a black ethnicity that transcended the legacy of slavery and colonialism. All right, so stop right there. Um, if you guys want to look more, you can check this book out. Old Islam in Detroit, Rediscovering the Muslim American Past. I'm quite sure you'll be able to find it on Amazon or you can find it on Google. And you can also go to Barnes and Nobles if they got it. So there it is. So it's a pretty interesting book that goes into the history about Detroit and the relationship of Islam in that city and whatnot and the Islamic community. All right. All right. So 
that's all I have for do say Muhammad. Now, this next individual, the reason why I want to do this topic on the next person, which is Sati Majid, because what's making it very interesting about him is um, not only did he have a similar concept as Duce Muhammad to unify the blacks and the uh, the Asian, the Middle Easterns and whatnot, but also he confronted Noble Drew Ali because when Noble Drew Ali said he was a prophet, that's when it became a question, well, hmm, this man claims that he a prophet. So if you're a prophet, show and prove that you're a prophet. And so with doing so, uh, Sati Majid went to the Islamic juris, jurists, right, which is called the fatwa. The fatwa means going to the authority, well, not the authority, but those who uh, know about the Islamic laws and question the legitimacy of a source or information, you know, bringing it to question and getting their information and getting their views on it and getting their answers and stuff like that. So that's what he was doing. He went to the Islamic jurist and showed them, hey, there's a guy that's saying that he's a prophet. So how do we go about addressing this? issue but anyways let's get to his story and find out who he was so right here i'm gonna leave this picture up oops that's a picture of sati majid All right, that's a picture of Sati Majid. And it's funny that I was able to find a Wikipedia source on him, but it's, it was written in Arabic. So by it being written in Arabic, they write from right to left. So I was able to get the translation English. All right. So here, that's the picture of him. And here's the introduction. Of course, it says, Sati Majid was a Sudanese Islamic preacher, the title of Sheikh of Islam in North America. All right. So as you see, as you can see, it says his birth and his upbringing. He is Sati Majid or Sati Muhammad Zwa al Dahab was born in the village of al Qadar, which is located on the east bank, eastern bank of the Nile in old Dagonla, Sudan, in 1883 from the family of Zwa al Dahab family, known for its religious position in the region, when its descendants inherited the Jewish jurisdiction and the jurisprudence of science religion. Sati Mahajid began his religious career in the retreat of Sheikh Awad in his hometown al Qadar. Then he completed memorizing the Quran and studied jurisprudence with Sheikh Ahmad and Didi in the village of Rumi al Bakari, west of the Nile, which is several kilometers from the village of al Qadar. Then, of course, it goes on to talk about how he traveled to seek knowledge and then he had a call. Okay. 
All right, so it said he traveled to Egypt in 1895 AD to complete his religious education where he studied at Al Azhar Science and Jurisprudence of Religion. And after that, he preferred to head towards the United Kingdom as a response to the official campaign in Britain Islam against Islam, which was represented in particular by the famous saying of Gaston that we cannot conquer the Muslims as long as they remain in the Kaaba and the Quran. And the saying of Lord Comer, British Council in Egypt, that Islam can in no way be reformed to keep pace with modern times. Upon his arrival in the United Kingdom, he got acquainted with two immigrants, one of whom is a Sudanese from Northern Sudan and the other is a Yemi. Sati Majid, was an eloquent orator and wandered the British Isles with his two companions, delivering his religious and propaganda lecture on Islam. And he attracted the attention of a large audience of British people and were affected by his speech a lot. But the number of those who converted to Islam was not known to him in Britain at that time due to the lack of sufficient information in this regard. All right. So that's the Wikipedia source. Okay, so let me go now to another source. So this source is called Sati Majid, a Sudanese founder of American Islam, an author by the name of Patrick D. Bowen. And it came from the source of the Journal of Africana Religions, volume one, number two, uh, 2013. Of course, these are the page number from 194 to, 2000 to 209. Those are the page number. It was published by the Penn State University Press. So go down. It says a Sudanese founder of American Islam. Of course, it says Sati Muhammad, Sati Majid Muhammad al Qadi Zuwa al Dahab, more commonly known as Majid Muhammad or Sati Majid, was a Sudanese Muslim missionary who lived in the United States from around 1904 to 1929. He worked primarily in Detroit, Pittsburgh, New York City, and Buffalo, like the other figures associated with the U.S. African Islamic identity rival. Majid did not promote a return to a traditional or medieval Islam. Instead, his message was a subconsciously modern one that incorporated liberal ideas such as a such as freedom of religion and anti-racism. Majid also became skilled in developing modern organization and in countering Western critics of Islam. After spending a quarter century in the United States, Majid transported these new perspectives and practice back to Africa. Let's read that again. After spending a quarter century in the United States, Majid transported these new perspectives and practices back to Africa, where his awareness of the United States and its Muslim continue to play a role in his religious work and thoughts. The, the story of his religious exchange with U.S. Muslims, black or otherwise, then is the story of how new emerging African religious identity and practice affected and were affected by people living beyond the borders of the African continent. And it says, past scholarships has given us only a very fragmented picture of Majid 20 odd years in the United States. U.S. English language newspaper articles and other new primary source data, this article reveals that Majid had a greater had a far greater influence on the development of Islam as an institutionalized and public American religion than has been previously thought. Maj was a trailblazing religious organizer who established Islamic groups in Detroit, Pittsburgh, New York City, and Buffalo, and he tirelessly promoted the anti-racist 
ideology that would help to make Islam an important religious and political tradition in African American culture. This article also revealed how Maj brought together and aided immigrant Muslims of various ethnicity and how he converted a number of African Americans to Islam. His American organization would eventually disappear and his work was largely forgotten. Yet Maj was one of the most influential Muslim in the United States during the interwar period and his legacy continued to shape Islam in the United States long after he departed North America. All right, so... Going down, it says, the evidence concerning Maj's earlier, earliest years in the United States is meager and occasionally conflicting. In interviews in the 1920s, Maj indicated that he had first come to the United States either in the 1912 or in 1915. However, a passenger coupon found in a collection of Maj documents suggests that he had arrived in the United States at the port of New Orleans in 1904. Finally, in a 1935 interview, he described doing religious work in the United States in 1908 and 1912. In his early years as a community organizer, Maj sought to aid his fellow countrymen and to establish a nationwide association for their political, industrial, and social betterment. Maj developed multiple contacts with foreign Muslims on the East Coast during the first two decades of the 20th century. For example, he knew Sheikh Mahmoud Ali, the Imam of the Ottoman Embassy Mosque, won the first organized and public mosque in the United States in Washington, D.C. In 1910, the Ottoman Kosoyate began to pay the rent for an apartment on the third floor of the 17 Rector Street in Lower Manhattan. The building was known as Oriental since Muslims and Asian immigrants had been living and selling Oriental wares from this location since the 1890s. Imam Mahmoud was an influential Muslim leader in the city and as a result of his religious exhortation, Local Muslims had begun more closely adhering to Islamic practices. As many as 75 to 100 Muslims frequently visited the Manhattan Mosque for prayer. Mahmoud, whom the Turkish government had named head of the spiritual affairs of the Mohammedans in this part of the world, also influenced the Muslim community beyond New York. He regularly traveled to and was the religious leader for Muslims in Boston, Lowell, and Rochester, Rochester, Massachusetts, and in Providence, Rhode Island. Given my mid success, it is not surprising that Maj found him to be a model leader. When Maj appeared in Detroit around 1912 or 1913, he attempted to emulate some of Mahmoud's techniques. He may have helped, for example, to establish the Islamic Benevolent Society, whose first priority was to build a mosque. After World War I plunged the Ottoman Empire into an ill-fated alliance with the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Maj organized aid efforts on behalf of the Muslim overseas. In 1920, Maj also facilitated the purchase of over 200 Muslim burial plots at different cemeteries. And in that same year, he led a Detroit chapter of the Red Crescent Society. During Maj's attempt to become a major player in Detroit's Muslim scene, he was also returned to New York to build a continuity there by 1921, Maj had set up an office near the Rector Street Mosque at 22 West Street in Manhattan. Maj tried to obtain financial assistance and employment for Muslim seamen who were living in the city. He also wrote letters to the British Consulate General asking for this assistance, explaining that these sailors who were probably Sudanese Yemi and South Asia had lived in British territory and had worked in, on the British ships. Therefore, he argued that the British government's aid evidence suggests that 
Through these efforts, Mosh developed a reputation, particularly with the city Sudanese community as a pastoral religious figure. In the meantime, Mosh also continued his work in Detroit. Around 1922, he established and became head of another, another organization known as the Muslim Welfare Society. Maj later explained that he was motivated in part by the various criticisms of Islam and Muslim in the local press. At the editorial portraying Islam in a negative light, Negative light ran in the Detroit Free Press in 1922. Maj was concerned about the attacks on the character of the modern Mohammedan, especially in Turkey. According to Maj, Muslims in India and the Middle East were often too often split, depicted as political radicals, when in truth they had been forced to it by the imperialists of Europe, who desired to keep the Muslim under their yoke as a slave forever. Maj expressed such views in various interfaith meetings and events inside and outside Detroit. So, as you see, this man was on the mission. He was on the mission to dispel this mythology about uh, the Islam and the Muslims being very radical by the Europeans. Okay, so he himself was a pan-Islamist. All right? He, pra he practiced pan-Islamism. That's what he was focusing on. It's just like Duse Muhammad Ali did. He was a pan-Islamist and a pan-African. So to this day, the whole criticism about Islam and the Muslims, of course, uh, being labeled as terrorists because of the misconception and the wars that's been going on, it's still happening. There's still a lot of discrimination against Muslims, and there's a lot of discrimination against the religion in itself. So United States, although you have the freedom of religion, United States is built off the concept of Christianity. So you got to understand that the, the uh, most popular Christian set is Roman Catholicism. Roman Catholicism is the most popular one in the United States. So, of course, they're going to have this attitude against other religion. They're going to call them pagans. They're going to look at them as being different or being strange. And they're going to see, and then they see some of them as being evil because based off the Christian doctrine, which is not really so Christianized, if you want to put it in a nutshell, they have this view where they want to be, it's more superior. Christianity is more superior in this country. So Christianity is always going to be the dominant religion in the United States. And that's why there's such attitude towards Islam. Again, yeah, there is a freedom of religion, but there's still going to be discrimination against the Muslim and the Islamic culture. All right. So go on to say that during the same year that the anti-Islam editorial ran, Maj was dealing with growing tension in the Detroit Muslim community. A representative of the Ahmadiyya movement, a South Asian-based missionary group, and the first Muslim group to convert thousands of African Americans to Islam had arrived in Detroit the year before. At the missionary Muhammad Saeed was respected for his religious knowledge and work. Soon, however, local Muslims noticed that the converts he made, most of whom were African American, was insisting that they should be allowed to continue some of their Christian practices. This angered some immigrants and they demanded that Ahmadi missionary leave the city, a demand to which Sa Saadi acquiesced in 1922. As the Ahmadi movement continued to grow, emerging as the first successful national missionary network of Maj and Islamic centers in the United States. Maj responded by attempting to obtain a fatwa or religious ruling against the U.S.-based Ahmadi missionaries. It was not the last time that he would seek to defend what he considered to be the true Islam against its other climates in a similar fashion. Maj would later seek official condemnation of the Moorish Science Temple. 
the other group that became successful in spreading an Islamic identity among African Americans across the East Coast and Midwest during the 1920s. Sati Maj struggled to assert Sunni Islamic authority over both Ahmadi and Moorish claims to Islam indicated the extent to which Islam was becoming an institutionalized religious tradition in the U.S. The establishment of religious congregation and the development of Muslim leadership that commanded both local and national followings conformed to larger patterns in the religious history of the United States. These institutions and leaders were competing for religious followers in a religious marketplace. Sati Maj, like others, joined the fray, sometimes exaggerating his accomplishment in order to prove the success of his efforts. So, so uh, Sati was trying to incorporate the Sunni Muslim doctrine, right, in Islam. Now, though he came from a liberal perspective, you know what I'm saying, it wasn't like the average Islam like it was in the medieval time period. However, he still wanted to be within the Sunnah. He still wanted to be in within the Quran and the Hadith. So that's why he was going to these Islamic juris, juris right, or doing the fatwa against the Moors and against the Ahmadiyya because he wanted to question, well, these people are teaching something totally different that's totally contrary from the Quran and the Hadith. So, yeah, you might think, oh, the, the man is snitching. So, basically, he was snitching. Kind of, he was snitching on the other Islamic organization, other people, because of what they were doing. But, you know, that's what he did. All right, so it says the shake. Of Buffalo Shake uh, America. Muslim immigrants from a wide variety of ethnic backgrounds began arriving to Buffalo, New York in the early 20th century, making it an attractive location for a man who was seeking out young Muslim community in need of a religious leader. By 1922, Buffalo Muslim con congregated at a Muslim owned coffee shop, a coffee house located at 450 Seneca Street, and it was an apartment above that very coffee house that Sati. Maj res resided from at least 1924 to 1972, I mean, 1927. Sati Maj was at the social center of the Buffalo community. From this address, Maj organized that what was probably his most successful local Islamic benevolent society. In June of 1924, he and five other local Muslim incorporated the Buffalo Muslim War Welfare Society, a group that was an immediate success by early September 1924. A local newspaper reported that 700 young men had already signed up and meetings are taking place frequently in halls in the Seneca Street section of Lackawanna, where many of the members lived and worked in the big, hill, big mills at Niagara Falls. And it says, in addition to financial duties, we'll All right, you guys, I'm back. Service done went out. Let's go ahead. Let me go back to where I was uh, reading. <clears throat> All right, right here it says, um, oh, it says, many members lived and worked in the big mills at the Niagara Falls. In addition to the financial duty required of a head of a typical benevolent society, collecting and managing money as well as organizing the members' activity, Maj was also concerned with assisting immigrant Muslims. He appeared in court as an interpreter and religious expert when needed. He helped the immigrants, Im yeah, immigrants learn English and U.S. custom. On at least one occasion, he held a meeting for Buffalo Muslims, many of whom were unemployed, at which he discussed industrial problems and ways to inform local employers about the Muslim employees' cu culture. 
And as a religious leader, Maj stressed the idea that it was possible to be both a true Muslim and a true American. The incorporation papers for his Buffalo Society endorsed adherence to American principle and the eradicator of all racial differences that might lead to disloyalty to the United States. At the same time, he stressed that Islam should be kept bright by the faithful under even under the new condition of life in America. To encourage this ma maintenance of faith, Maj attempted to obtain Islamic reading materials and to build a mosque. And it's also, it said, Maj also had a vision for becoming not just the sheikh or leader of Buffalo, but also the sheikh of America. During this period, he tried to form a national organization that would link together his various local benevolent society. It was called the United Muslim Society. Maj claimed that the UMS was supported by at least 100,000 Muslims, but in all likelihood, no more than a few thousand people were involved with the organization. In the end, the organizational success of the UMS is difficult to assess. Since the name was not used by many of Maj local groups, rather, the, rather these organizations such as those in 1920s, Detroit, Pittsburgh, and Buffalo were often called the Muslim Welfare Society instead. All right, it says, notwithstanding Maj's exaggerating exaggeration of his achievement, the founder of the group was an important milestone in this history of Islam in the United States. It proved contrary to some previous scholarly assumption that immigrants and foreign Muslims in the United States were already attempting in the 1920s to establish national umbrella organization, the Federation of the Islamic Association of the United States and Canada. Founded by World War II veteran Abdullah Igram of Cedar Rapid Iowa is often thought to be the first such Sunni Muslim organization in the United States. Maj's effort indicated that long before the 1950s, some Muslims felt confident enough to deal with the various federal, state, and local laws and social customs that govern and shape religious organization in the United States. The UMS embodied a growing sense among American Muslims that they were part of a national as well as an international and local community. The group existing also show a larger tendency in the interwar period among foreign immigrants and indigenous Muslims, especially Muslims who consider themselves to be non-white to coordinate activities, interact and pray together. <clears throat> All right, so right here, the missionary to focus on African-Americans community. Now, before I go any further, it sounds like to me, not only he was trying to build a coalition between the Orientals and the African Americans and the African community, or try to build a, build a pan Islamism, but also he was a capitalist. And a lot of them were, a lot of them were capitalists, okay? That's just the facts. So as I'm reading and I'm understanding that it seems like it's more about capitalizing, which is why for him, it, the, the concept of organization was important. Yeah, he was trying to do good things, but it was a business to him as well. So think about that. One day I'm going to deal with a topic about black capitalism and capitalism. Because we have to really touch on this. We have to really understand the origins behind all these organizations and the leaders that was the founders of the organization and how they ran it and what was the purpose. So go ahead, continue. Missionary focus on African Americans. Maj effort, I mean early efforts in Detroit and New York and his local success in Buffalo were important contribution to the to the, the building of Islam as an institutionalized religion in the United States but it was Maj um, I mean Maj focused on including American born blacks and Sunni Muslim organization that helped to change the face of both American and African religious history in the 20th century in 1927 for example Maj 
spearheaded the organization of the African Muslim Welfare Society of America in Pittsburgh. The AMWSA filed for incorporation in January 1928, stated that its purpose was to unite the Muslim people and eradicate it racial differences due to their color and nationality and bring them in closer association with each other. FBI files revealed that the congregation was primarily composed of Arab immigrants and black borns in the United States and the Caribbean. The members like Maj wore fezes and long robes and speakers at its meetings read the Quran. Okay. Even after Maj left the country in 1920, 1929, the group remained intact, opened an Arabic school, and stayed in touch with Maz. In the corpora incorporation records for the AMWSA, it is indicated that the branches had already established in Detroit, New York City, and Cleveland, the last two of which are confirmed in the letters sent by AMWSA members. The FBI files also connected the AM. WSA to the Muslim community in Chicago, Cincinnati, and Washington, D.C. <laughs> of all the African-American Sunni Muslim individuals whom Maz influenced during his work with these groups and his other missionary activities, no one turned out to be more important than Dawood Akman Faisal, who was born David A. Donald in Grenada in 1891. Donald arrived in the United States at the age of 21. Though he was a skilled tailor, music was his true forte. And within a decade, David Donald had a developed had developed a relatively successful career in the music industry. In addition to being a professional violinist or violinist, Donald worked as a music teacher, musician manager, and for a time, a musician union leader. In 1924, he married Clara Forbes, a black Bermudian who joined her husband teaching students at his Donald Concert Bureau. Then in 1925, Donald became a naturalized U.S. citizen. All right, so I'm going to skip that part down. All right, so let's look at the global legacy of Sati Majid. So Majid left the United States on January 13, 1929. One of his first acts when he arrived in Cairo was apparently to seek a fatwa against Noble Jew Ali's national movement in the Moorish Science Temple of America, requesting a fatwa from scholars at Al-Azhar. He noted correctly that Noble Jew Al Noble Drew made claims that he was a prophet and that he claimed to have received a revelation, the Holy Quran of the Moor Science Temple, which was in 1927, that contained not one verse of the Quran. Official at Al-Azhar not only issued a fatwa in Arabic, but also offered an official English translation, apparently for American distribution that declared Noble Drew to be an opposer and disbeliever. Maj also obtained support for the fatwa from religious scholars in the Sudan. But the victory was a hollow one. There is no evidence that the fatwa ever reached American shores before it was published as a and and denim in an academic article in 1990s. Maj apparently had hoped to return to the United States and armed with the armed with this official condemnation of noble Drew Ali. It would be more weapon allowing him to compete with other Muslim leading leaders for followers. Maj attempted to raise funds for his return to the United States, and he asked Al-Azhar to designate him as an official Islamic missionary to America. But in 1934, official Al-Azhar denied requests, stating he lacked the proper scholarly credential for such a job. Well, damn. Damn, that was a slap in the face. That's a slap in the face. Anyways, instead of returning to the United States, Maj divided his time in the 1930s between Egypt and the Sudan. In Cairo, he participated in Islamic Convention, founded an Arabic language Islamic magazine, and established a society known as the Islamic Unity Association based at Al Azhar, but with branches in other locations. Such efforts 
must have reflected the skills, experience, and knowledge he had acquired in the United States. Maj left Africa as a young man with moderate religious training and life experience. He had returned as a seasoned missionary, apologist, community organizer, and religious leader. And so Maj also continued to be linked to the African-American Muslims in the United States in 1930. It's likely, for example, that some of the African-Americans who Maj had converted followed him to Egypt during that decade. U.S. converted were also male the magazine that he worked on, and they were included as member of his Cairo-based association. His followers continued to correspond with him during the 1930s, expressing enthusiasm for Maj activities and their desire for news from both African Muslims and the greater Muslim world. In 1932, for example, E.L. Martin and Helena Keeley wrote to Maj to acknowledge the receipt from, of a letter from him and his magazine. Apparently, Maj also proposed that the group established transatlantic trade among Egypt, Abyssinia, which is which was Ethiopia. Um, I mean, which was the name of Ethiopia at the time. Sudan and African Americans in the United States. <clears throat> in addition, he requested that his followers in Pittsburgh send him money. Mari and Keeley responded by saying that although they had four men in mind for the import business, they could not provide any funds from their depleted treasury. Another writer from Williskinburg, Pennsylvania, expressed sympathy for Ethiopians in their struggle against the Italian and dream of one day returning to our homeland, Africa, in Shalom. The writer wrote, I would be glad if we could colonize in or near Abyssinia as we feel we need a colony. All right. So such correspondence demonstrated a growing sense of belonging among some African-Americans to both Pan-African and a Pan-Islamic identities in 1930s. Maj follow, followers combining Sunni Islamic religious practices with anti-colonialism and pan-African ethnic identities. And this intersection of culture, politics, ethnicity, and religion was one already theorized by pan-African and Arthur and Liberian nationalist Edward Whitman Blyden in the 19th century and by the African Times and Orient Review founder Duse Muhammad Ali in the 20th century. But now the intellectual work of those men had become a grassroots phenomenon expressed in transatlantic correspondence between a Sudanese missionary and his African-American followers in Pennsylvania. So Maj died in 1963, never have returned to the country in which he devoted a quarter century of religious work. Only now are we beginning to understand his importance to the history of the U.S., Muslim community. Long before Malcolm X went on his famous Hajj in 1964, there were already American-born and African-born Black Sunni Muslims in the United States as tolling the ways in which Islam united all human races across color line. And it says, a Sunni missionary who commanded a significant following in both the immigrant and indigenous Muslim community attempted to do so. While that effort failed, Maj's influence and memory remained alive in several cities where he inspired or founded welfare society. All right, it says Maj also maintained links to African American Muslims in the United States and helped to foster among them the sense that they were part of a much larger African Islamic world. So that's this article. If you guys want to check the article out, it's called uh, Sati Maj, a Sudanese founder of American Islam uh, from Patrick D. Bowen. So what I can understand from this is that um, Sati was pretty much starting to become envy of the Ahmadian and Noble Jurali's more scientific of America. So for him, even though he was doing great things and he was teaching Sunni Islam, he was also looking for ways to make profit. 
that's that. And so he was saying that, oh, Noble Jr. Ali is teaching these people that he's a prophet and that he was uh, sent by Allah and that the Quran was revealed to him. He was like, man, what the hell is going on now? We going I need to do something. Well, somebody needs to stop this, man. That's not fair that he's getting all these followers and he's making all his money. And I'm trying to teach people about the Sunni Islam, but I ain't getting no revenue. I ain't getting compensated for that. I'm having a hard time with this. But we can get, what the hell, where am I doing wrong? So that's how he feels. Like, what the hell am I doing? Why is this man getting all this recognition? Hold on, we need to take this to the higher-ups to figure out what's going on. And so let us let me show you guys one more thing. Um, this is coming from my... my uh, this is coming from the app called The Script, and I'm going to take you to my account on here. So you guys need to, uh, there we go. All right. So you guys, make sure you download Script. It's a good app. So I want to show you guys something. This right here. All right. So the title of this book. Or this title of this document is called A Sudanese Missionary to the United States. Saiti Maj Sheikh Al Islam in North America and his account with Noble Jew Ali, prophet of the Moorish Science Temple Movement. Okay. So going down to the introduction, say sometimes in the late 1920s, there was an encounter, direct or indirect, we do not know the we do not know for certain between two figures from two very different is tradition of Islam. The present article partially documents this encounter, presenting a tantalizing glimpse of Amer African American Islam earliest encounter with global Sunni Islam. On the on the one side is a Sudanese alim, the very model of non-valid Islamic orthodoxy. On the other is an African-American, a generation only removed from slavery and after in the great northward migration that was to transform the African-American worldview as it was later to transform the world music. The Sudanese alim was Sati Maj Muhammad al Qadi from the Gola. The African-American was Timothy Drew, later known as Noble Drew Ali from North Carolina. The topic also opens up new avenues for research into the uh, missionizing activities of immigrant Sunnis, Ahmadis, and other Muslim groups, and for the history of the Moorish Science Temple, which latter movement may in some case, some sense have been even unconsciously a link between the Islam of some African slaves in the antebellum South and the lost and found nation of Islam of Elijah Muhammad. All right. So goes into the biography about each individual. All right, so right here it goes down to the encounter. So here's the encounter. Um, it says, Sati does not make it clear how he encountered Noble Drew Ali. His account is vague. He begins by saying the Noble Drew Ali was set up by some bigots or fanatics, gave himself a prophetic name, and wrote a Quran. Sati continues that one of those who were following true Islam brought him one of Ali's book, and presumably the Quran. He read it, but did not find any verse of the Quran or a hadith of the prophet in it. The Quran in question has, as its full title, the Holy Quran or Quran of the Moorish Science Temple of America. Although Wilson said that it is more commonly known as the Circle 7 Quran, from the design at the front of the book, it is a mystical composition called from another, a, from a number of sources. But the 
But according to Abby White, over half of it taken from the Aquarian Gospel of Jesus the Christ by Levy H. Downing of Ohio. Sati says that he wrote to Noble Drew Ali and advised him to change his name and burn his book. The indignation Sati undoubtedly felt come through vividly in his account. Sati continues by saying that he attempted to take Ali to court to seek American justice and put the latter to the test. And it's written in Arabic. I'm going to try my best to read it. Thama ini talab tuhu lil mudhan kama aman ma adalat akumat ahadihi bala ani baha akumat al walat al matahida al amirkul kura le aja al imandan so sati wanted ali to prove his prophethood by performing miracles that is those miracles that only a prophet can perform he then says that he approached the government personally since this man was bringing the islamic faith into dispute or yeah yeah, this disrepute. The U.S. government, Department of Justice, we are told, refer Sati to the men of knowledge and religion as the suitable people to deal with such matter. Sati somewhat lamely concludes his account by saying that he continued to raise the issue of Ali's claim in the newspaper. There is a puzzle here. From Azan Udan and Lincoln, let's see. Yeah, and Lincoln up to the more recent studies, there has been a great deal of research on the origin of African American Islam. It seems strange, especially in the light of some of the documents presented here of American provent provenance or yeah, provenance that no echo of this controversy has been found in a historical record in America. In writing a Quran and in claiming prophetic status, however, defined Noble Drew Ali was outraging the Orthodox Muslim sensibility of Sati Maj. It is unreasonable to expect the latter to have been uh, sensitized to the African-American need to create alternative worldview and their receptivity to such current as Freemasonry, Garveyism, and similar. Sati reacts in the appropriate Sunni Muslim way. He seeks a fatwa from his from his would-be automator Al-Azhar al in Cairo, Kademi Ali. Thus, he travels to Cairo and presents a formal ishtifa ish request for a fatwa or judicial opinion, which he duly receives. And it says the interest in the ishtifa lies in Sati's summation of what he thought was Ali's doctrinal position, although it is for specialists in African-American Islam to evaluate this Further, our impression based on Wilson, Lincoln, and others is that Sati does not too grievously misrepresent Noble Drew Ali. The latter, the latter did write a book entitled The Holy Quran. He he did in some way regard himself as a Sharif. He did proclaim a new revelation out of Morocco, the land of the Moors, and he did claim to have traveled and been with the Ulama of various Muslim countries. In other words, on the basis of what we know about Ali's doctrinal position, the charges from Sati's perspective were not false. The response from the Middle East is equally difficult to evaluate. One interpretation is to view the various fatwas that Sati obtained as essentially routine documents. The problem with this that a Mutanabi or would be prophet in the US in the 1920s could hardly have been a routine destination. Again, we are to a large degree in the dark. 
All right. And so that's all the information that was available. Um, I mean, there's more about Noble Drew Ali and Sati Maj conflict. However, pretty much it doesn't give more account as to how the conflict took place, except the fact that he wrote a letter and what other information was said. So you guys want to check it out. You guys can look it up. Just go on. All right, here we go. Yeah, just go on Scribd. Go on the Scribd app and you guys can uh, pull up different documents, articles, and books, and auto books. And also, <clears throat> it's $9.99 a month. So if you guys want to get that, you can do that as well. So right here is the title, A Sudanese Missionary to the United States. All right. Okay. So that concludes for today's channel and topic. Uh, again, these two men were very prominent in the African community and throughout the Pan-African community. And as you can see, they had good intentions on trying to unify the African and the African Americans globally through the concept of Islam. So they both both was very prominent. They both were very passionate about their religion, especially Sati Majid. He was very passionate. He wanted to really uh, organize and unify, but the way he was going about things, it pretty it pretty much ruined his reputation because you know he was going to he was doing the fatwa and trying to you know discredit noble Drew Ali and it didn't work out for him in his favor so it didn't work out too well for him at the very end um so his or that's why you don't hear much about his organization and what he has achieved you see what i'm saying so when he left the united states he didn't get a chance to come back to the united states and there's some, I'm quite sure there's still some organization around, like I say, in Detroit, by Be Detroit being a very a foundation where, you know, the Islamic practice is very popular up there. Uh, they probably still follow his teachings and whatnot. But um, there's a little count on the information about Sati Majid and his life and whatnot. Um but yeah, that kind of ruined his reputation. So when he did the fatwa or went to the Islamic official, right, to get their opinion, to show them the book, that kind of just, it just messed him up. He wasn't getting as much support. So Noble Jura Ali at the time, he was getting a lot of support. He was getting a lot of followers. And to this day, he still got a lot of following. <laughs> you know, so... Yeah, and that was making a lot of or see the Orthodox Muslim because I grew up in the Sunni Islam myself. Okay. And the Orthodox Muslim, they take that very seriously. So when there's another organization coming around talking about, especially somebody as a leader proclaiming themselves to be a prophet, they gonna take that very seriously. All right. So Sati was a very passionate Muslim and he took that very seriously. He took that to the heart. Like, oh, no, you claim yourself to be a prophet. Really? Oh, nah, no, 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 partner. We're going we gonna to clear we gonna clear this up. We're going to dismantle this because, see, you're not going to walk around just brainwashing the people into believing that you're a prophet. So Sati wasn't having it. He was like, nah, we're going to do something about this. I'm going to take this to the higher official over at my automator at the university I graduated from and show them this bullshit. Because that's how he was thinking. He was like, I'm going to show them this bullshit and let them see what type of shit that this guy's on. So that was his attitude. Um, <laughs> again, it didn't work out for him. It didn't, it didn't do nothing because the United States government ain't going to really do nothing about it. They're not going to stop on me. Yeah, of course, Noble Drew Ali had FBI on him. That was about it. But they couldn't really stop him from saying that he was a prophet 
I mean, what could they do? What else? I mean, it, the United States was not under uh, Islamic uh, jur jurisprudence, you know what I'm saying, or a jurisdiction. So it's not uh, Islamic culture. So it wasn't like much was going to really happen. But that's how it was at that time period. That's how he felt. And do say Muhammad, again, he was very passionate. He was a very, he was a man that was about nobility. And he uh, wanted to just, his whole agenda was to bring the Oriental and African people together and under the name of, you know, against uh, racism and colonialism and also under the name of Islam. So both of these men, you know, did what they could. Anyways, I'm going to go ahead and log off. Thank you guys so much for watching. And if you guys like the channel, go ahead and subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell. Make sure you share the channel, share the content. Uh, if you don't like the channel, you give it a thumbs down. That's all right with me. All right. But I really appreciate you all uh, tuning in for those of you that's watching. And thank you for those of you who have subscribed to the channel. My new subscribers, shout out to y'all. Until then, I will reconnect with each and every last one of you. So take it easy on yourself. Enjoy your Ramadan. Salam alaikum to all the Muslims out there who's celebrating this Ramadan. Please be safe. Uh, Y'all ain't got that much long, so it's okay. I know it's tough, especially during this pandemic, but y'all gonna get there. All right. And for those of you guys that's taking your vaccination, make sure you guys be careful. I hope everybody's okay. Um, I know the vaccine then cause some side effects to certain individuals who may have some health issues. So just take it easy on yourself, you know, and for those of you that are not vaccinated, you know, please make sure that you are very careful and very diligent. Um, the virus is still around. So just be aware and, you know, wear your mask at all times when it's necessary. All right. Other than that, this is your girl, Tiffany. And y'all have a good one. And I'll talk to y'all later. All right. Peace.